Well, we've just completed the one hour, 45 minute drive from the Fox offices in Essex, and we've now arrived in Oxfordshire at the historical linear fisheries complex. For the next 48 hours, I'm gonna be joining Tom Maker on the banks of Manor Farm, a lake that holds carp to just shy of 50 pound. It's early April, the big girls are due, and I can't wait to get in the swim and start picking Tom's brains and hopefully get amongst some of these Oxfordshire carp. So Tom, I've now got my gear set up in the swim, forecasting a bit of rain so thought we'd get the camp up. You're already set up in this swim anyway and this is where we're going to be starting the session anyway. Yeah. Talk me through the process that you'd go through. You've got the open water out in front of you. Is it just chucking singles straight away or are you going to find a spot and you're going to try and work with something? You know, I've fished here for a number of years now and like every time I come here, I'm most confident when I've got bait out. And If you're going to put bait out, you're going to be obviously putting it on a spot which is where you're going to be putting your free rods. I just think that with, a, with singles, it's a bit like, it almost a bit hit and miss. I'm, it, there's a lot of fish in all the lakes and you want to sort of build up a bit of a hit of fish and the only way you're really going to do that, unless they're absolutely having it on zigs, is by finding a spot and putting bait on it. The area that I'm on is clay, um, which that's not the only area of clay out there, um, but you, you're sort of just looking for a, a, a clear area, somewhere that you can present your rigs. I don't genuinely think it matters about how far you are, what you're aiming towards, how deep it is. If you can get an area that's nice and clear, you can present three rigs over the top and present bait over it as well. Like for me, that that's good enough, you know. And it, I come in, I come up here week in, week out, and some weeks it might not work, but you know, over the course of a year, it's going to work more often than it isn't. So first things first, I'll be getting a lead on on, this, on a spot marker rod, chucking it out, finding a spot, making sure you're happy with that spot. And once you're, you're happy with the spot and you've got it marked out, you know then for the duration of your session, and unless something drastically changes or you move, that that's going to be the spot that you're going to be focusing all your attention and on. And then you're going to take, we take the lead off and we put the spot on. Normally I'd fish with a marker rod yeah. and a spod rod and I'd pop the float and then I'd clip to the float and, yeah. and work like that. But obviously having worked with you for a number of years, you're doing everything on the one rod. You just Yeah, just yeah. all on the one rod. Like I, I honestly can't remember the last time I used, used a marker float, certainly for casting to. The only time I would have used one would be for finding the depth to put a zig on. But cool. you know, you can find just as much you know, with a ledge. The float doesn't aid you at all in helping find anything. Um, and are you clipping up the you, spot shorter of the lead? Or, well, or? This, this side of the lake we're fishing is only about sort of six, seven foot, so right. everything's done the same because cool. you've got braid on your spot and you've got mono on your fishing rod. So by the time you four ounce lead's taking some stretch out, obviously you're going to be landing in the same sort of area. Yeah. So provided you've got your visual marker sort of in your head where you're going, you know, you don't need a marker float to cast to. So like I say, once that's clipped up, your rods are clipped. It's a case yeah. of just getting all your baits on your rigs, putting them out like bang, 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 all three rods out and then starting off light with a bait. You know, I, I, I don't talking? know, I start with sort of like between five and seven, depending on yeah. like how accurate they go. If, if it looks like it's gonna go slightly, of course I'll just stop it. Um, and as well, you don't know who's been in the peg before you. No. I, I know prior to me getting in there, there was, there was two lads fishing in there over the weekend. Um, no, I didn't actually see them fish, didn't see where they were fishing, and I didn't know how much bait they put in. So if I go horse in a load of bait in, I could just be putting a load of bait on top yeah. of someone else's bait. So it's best off to start sort of Cautious, light yeah. and then build it up. Okay. So, that, All right. That's how I'd start. Well, you've had three three fish before we've got here, so that approach seems to have worked so far. So yeah. I think this is as good a starting point as any. I'll I'll get the leading rod out and uh, let's have a go. Have a look. So awesome. Thanks, mate. Now one. <laughs> Go on, boy. That five ounce load of yours crashing in. <laughs> well, I've just been leading about, found a nice spot, got my rods all wrapped up, just about to put some baits on, get them out. Tom said that bite time was probably about half five, so a little bit earlier than yesterday then. Yeah. But encouraging. But what's quite bizarre is that this is the fourth bite I've had in every single one of them on the middle rod. Hmm. And they're only like 
probably six, a spot six. within a spot then. Yeah, six feet apart, but yeah, it is quite weird. He's got to land on top of a certain tree before I leave it, so okay. you know, it could be a spot within a spot. You're getting bites on top of the tree? On top of the tree, <laughs> <laughs> That's a result. Right, I'll try that. How's it going, Tom? Yeah, good. How long's it been on for now? Ages. <laughs> I don't know what I'm more nervous about, playing the fish or you getting in my landing net. <laughs> Get in the net! <laughs> oh, no! No, all I've got is the, the corner rig. <laughs> Look! That's the most horrendous piece of angling I've ever seen. <laughs> Come on, baby. Come on, baby. Can't believe what started as such a twitchy takes escalating into such a battle. Lou, get on the net. Well, this is the time to redeem yourself. I can't look, Lewis. I ain't stabbing at it. No, no, but you're going to get it in, aren't you? <laughs> Go on, your wellies have got more on them than that. I'm not getting wet. They have. Hang on a minute, let me get it over the net first. Go on. Well done, Lewis, you've netted a fish for me. <laughs> yeah, for you now as well. Fish pump. Cheers, Lou. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least he's netted it and I've not got, he's got a hook link and a hook bait in my net. How big do you reckon that? Oh, that's a 30, I reckon. Mate, easy. 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 So basically, it's been 24 hours without a bite and it was pretty much to the minute that I've had a bite the same time as what I did yesterday and uh, yeah, it come in pretty easy to be fair and then it's just gone absolutely crazy sort of in and around the margin, stripping me sort of like 50, 60 yards of line off again and it surfaced and it's actually quite a big fish. It's, uh, it's probably over 30 pound. I don't want to get too excited, but it, it looks to me like it's over 30 pound and this one was nailed on a 360 with a, with a yellow pop-up. So at least Lewis can see what color it's on too. He knows I'm not trying to pull him a fast one. Like I said, it's on, it was on a 360 rig, so what I've done as soon as the fish has gone into the net, broken the net down, rolled the net out, what I'm going to get my retainer sling, slide it underneath the fish and just transfer it to the mat inside the retainer. So, yeah, compose myself. I'm going to get the retainer under it and let's get out and have a look at it. Oh, yeah. oh he'll do. He's definitely... I'll just check all these pecs are in line. Right, ready? Oh god, that's quite big, that. Yeah. Oh, look at that bad boy. Oh yeah. In the bottom lip, literally, hide the hook, pop it out. No harm done at all. And there it is. Yellow pop-up, whittled down, so it's critically balanced on a 360. Lewis, you saw it here first. How about that? 34 pound, 14 ounce man and mirror. And they uh, come exactly the same time as what I had the bite yesterday. Lewis has just, had just got here, just started getting his rod sorted and redeemed himself as well because he netted it. And uh, this one I'm holding up for a catch picture unlike Mary. So brilliant. So 34 pound, 14, it's the fourth one I've had. Hopefully it's the first of many and Lewis can get, get in amongst a few as well. So um, following Tom's awesome start to our filming session with the with the 34 pounder, he's read on all three of his rods. Um, at the same time, I'd, I was getting my rods out. Um, Tom, you've topped your spot up with half a dozen spots. Yeah, just another sort of five or six out there. And I've probably put a dozen or so spots out over over my area. <clears throat> I've got two rods fishing exactly how Tom fishes. So lead core leaders, lead clip. Uh, 360 rig tied up exactly the same and a yellow pop-up just exactly the same as, as Tom and then I've got one rod um, how I would fish personally so it'd be interesting that's on 
a naked line set up, uh, a really short stiff hinge rig uh, with a court ball pop up. So it'd be interesting to see whether that, that makes any kind of a difference or not. But uh, you know, I'm committed to fishing like Tom. Plan, give it till the morning. Yeah, give it yeah. till the morning on the bottom. And if it's not happening on the bottom, you, your feeling is it's the zigs. There's loads yeah. of sw like um, seagulls bombing around early just above the surface and like you know they're on a hatch the fish that we've seen this evening they're a sort of bit you know they're a bit flappy when they're rolling over and it is only shallow in front of us so that's why fishing at night on the deck is is the way forward and you're you know you are predominantly going to catch the better fish on the deck rather than a zig but you know during the day when it's quiet we'll, we'll go zigs cool i'm looking forward to that it'd be it'd be good to have a bit of a chop and change a bit more active fishing yeah and stuff so that work in cool. the layers sort of finding what one's the best and then you know the first bite we get on a zig bang we just change more to that depth leave one each on the bait two each on zigs and then if we catch one on a zig you know it doesn't matter what part of the lake it's come from all four go on exactly the same depth and the same color cool sounds the plan well we're going to uh, sign off for the evening have a few cups of hot chocolate and a bit of banter hopefully yeah. um and hopefully by the morning we'll be able to show you a nice scaly manor mirror cut no scalies no scalies uh, yeah I'm not, <laughs> I'm not driven all this way to catch a scaly fish <laughs> Right, it's about nine o'clock uh, in the morning. A very uneventful night for both myself and Tom, and by the sounds of it, everybody around the lake uh, too. So, it's time for a change. I've asked Tom what would he be doing in this situation if we weren't here, if there's no cameras here, and he said, we need to put the zigs out. Nobody's catching, everybody's on the bottom. There's the odd fish showing, there's birds swooping on the surface. Looks like there's a good chance up in the water. So, I've got all three rods tied up on zigs now. One at five foot, one at six foot, one at seven foot. I'm going to get them out. I've put my rods to the right hand side of Tom's now because the fish are showing to the right hand side of the swim. And then uh, I think once my rods are out, Tom's going to be doing the same and swapping some of his over onto Ziggs as well. So let's get them out there. Well, as per the plan, we sort of waited for the morning bite time to pass, even though I've not, the, the, the night prior to Lewis getting there, I hadn't actually had a bite at night. It, it, this time of year, you would still expect it to happen, so you've got to keep them down on the deck. But the plan was, if it hadn't happened on the deck, to, to go on to zigs. And a few fish have crashed out to the right of me, so Lewis has switched his rods over the other side of where, of where I'm fishing and chucked some zigs out onto some showing fish. And I just changed all of mine over and this one's probably been out 20 minutes and it's gone. Um, four foot this one as well, which is probably about seven foot out there. So, you know, it's a three feet underneath the surface. And um, yeah, like I say, it's ripped off. Feels like the lead's come off and it's sort of kiting all around the swim. And it's just got caught behind something now. So I'm just gonna keep a little bit of pressure on it and hopefully it comes free. But it just shows even though it's, you know, it is cold. I'm, I'm, well, I'm shivering. It's a northerly wind straight in our face, and to be fair, it feels like it's mid-April, mid-March rather than mid-April. This one's just caught on something, so I'm going to keep a bit of steady pressure on it. No, I don't think it's cut me off. I've still got the leg clip and everything on there. It's like a line snag, I reckon. Yeah, it's cut the ziglet. Cut it right by the hook. <laughs> <laughs> what a bummer. Oh well. Because it went over Lewis's lines and we were trying to like knit one pearl one. And I sort of like just there's another fish just crashed. And you just take your your focus off it for a little bit. It you know it, it can just dive into a bit of weed or dive behind a bar and it just just come off, it's just one of them, isn't it? That's zig fishing for you. They're an absolute nightmare, zigs. 
but they're a brilliant method to get bites on. I'll blame Lewis. It's Lewis's fault. So yeah, the plan as per what we sort of agreed last night is with the zigs, once you've sort of had a bite on one depth, they generally tend to be at all at the same depth. So yeah, that one was on a four foot red and black, red aligner, black piece of foam. So what I'm probably gonna do now is change my other two over and obviously put the one back out on on that four foot and then get Lewis to do the same with his as well, red and blacks. We've got six out and that one's gone, so the chances are maybe that's that's what they're looking for is a, is a red and black aligner out there or a red and black combination. So you can only try, chuck them out. The, the bite time off the bottom seems to be about five o'clock in the evening. So you, we've got like four or five hours left to sort of mess about with Zig really until we want to get them back on the deck ready for later on but this has been a bit of a dead period for the last couple of days so there's no point sitting on the bait as as hard as it's like it is not to do that you might as well try and make the most of of what's going on and there's plenty of fish crashing and you know if they're crashing they're in the upper layers so definitely the zigs i think they're gonna you know they're gonna produce a couple more bites hopefully we'll be more successful with the next one So we get more success with this one. So Tom, a little while ago you said to me, um, after you'd cooked some food and that, you was going to sort of give it another hour and then look at putting rods back out on the bottom because you've seen a little sort of slick come up off the baited area. Yeah. But obviously now having had a second bite on the zig within sort of an hour, what? It's kind of made me a bit reluctant to do it. Go, going on, obviously before you got here, I was, I'd was, i obviously got here at about 11 o'clock the previous day. Um, and I fished through the day and didn't have anything and it was at like half past five, quarter to six when I had the bite. Then yesterday I didn't fish while I was waiting for you to come down. So didn't really know if it was, you know, maybe it was a coincidence, but six o'clock again yesterday evening, bang, it's gone with that, 30, that 35 pounder. Nothing through the night. Probably, truth be told, if we kept zigs out last night, we'd have kept the bites coming. I think it's quite a good point, though, that it's not high pressure. It's no, it's sunny. low pressure. It's 991 pressure, which... Really cloudy. It is what you would say good bottom bait condition. Mate, do you know what? Of all the... You know, I've fished a lot this year already, and probably in terms of bottom fishing conditions, this is probably the best I've been out in. And something in my head is telling me that you're almost wasting your time by fishing on the bottom during the day. So just because sometimes it, you, you think, you know, you shouldn't be doing it. You know, there was a lot of anglers are packed up now, but you know, we were saying last night, sort of 16, 18 anglers on here, every single one of them fishing on the bottom. The only person that's had a bite in the past 24 hours prior to the zig bites was me. We're fishing in the shallowest part of water. And, you know, if everyone's fishing on the deck and you've got say six, seven, 800 fish in here, the chances are the fish aren't on the deck. And it's, I know it's an obvious thing to say, but don't be afraid to change and, and come up despite what the weather's doing. But the thing is, nature's still nature. There's obviously a hatch going off. Yeah. Um, the birds are swooping and taking things off the surface. The fish have been showing where you've chucked your zigs and had bites. So yeah. just because- It makes it easier if they're showing as well. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like you can visually see them. So you're not just chucking them into thin air. You're, you're actually casting them to something that's worth like that's worth aiming towards. This has gone right under them two rods and right now. Well, after an uneventful night on the bottom and uh, the morning feeding period passed without any action, tactical decision, changed all six rods over to zigs. Not long after we switched over, I had a bite on a four footer. So all of them come in, they all got changed to four footers. Unfortunately, the first one I hooked, I lost. 
which is always the way we zig fish in, but um, that weren't the case for the second bite. Um, 20, 25 minutes after chucking it back out, it's ripped off again, exactly the same rod, similar sort of area, four foot zig, red aligner, black foam, and this one decided to, uh, to stay on. A lovely manor mid 20. Things have quietened down a bit since Tom's little flurry of action with the two two bites in sort of half an hour or so. So I uh, thought it was a good opportunity to talk to Tom a bit about the rig that he's been catching off the bottom with because that's uh, he's had he had three fish before we arrived uh, and he obviously had that 34 yesterday. So four fish on this session on the rig. It's the 360 rig. Um, so Tom, let's just have a look at that in a bit of detail. So basically, that is it. It's, uh... They're nice and basic. I've got a um, pre-tied lead core leader. I always use them. You know, where you're allowed to use lead core, it just makes my fishing so much easier because I always fish with like a, a mono and then a braided chalk leader. So at the end of the leader, I'll have a, a you know a large loop. So if I want to change from, say, a lead clip if I'm using a 360, uh, an inline if I'm using a solid bag, or like today, I can quickly whip these off, replace it with, um, you know, just a lead clip and a bit of sleeve in, and I can just go straight over to Zig. So yeah. just a ready tied lead core leader four ounce lead i always use a fairly big lead you know a because when i'm chucking it out there it's going to get out to the spot i'm not going to be like thrashing a light lead and thrashing the water to a foam to try and get it there. a big lead and once that lead sunk sat on the bottom obviously if the fish is picking up a hook bait against a four ounce lead it's going to really going to drive you know drive the hook home yeah. you know quick change swivel on the end which is nice and simple if you get fish in the net you can unhook the rig and you know so on and so forth so not a massively long boom, sort of six to seven inch boom. And that's um, the, that's, that's the 25 pound yeah. mat cortex. You know, it's got a, an element of stiffness to it. So as as the lead hits the deck, you know, the, the bait, when I come to sort of shaving the bait down, is critically balanced. And the stiffness of the material is always pushing the bait away. So it's always like setting itself perfectly after the cast and resetting itself should it get picked up and, you know, I'm not hooking a fish or it's getting wafted around or what have you size 11 ring swivel and then at the end of the material rather than tying it straight to the swivel just to add like an extra little bit of movement to it i just tie the swivel onto a loop so you've got a yep. little bit of extra movement i mean that that's that's quite a small loop but normally i'd make it maybe a couple of mil bigger than that just for a little bit more movement and then size 5 medium curve um you obviously you're, you're threading the hook through the swivel and rather than using two beads i literally put on the micro um ring swivel and then one bead just to trap it in place and then obviously you're just sort of dobbing the bait on there with a little bit of bait floss and that is pretty much it and like you said that at the moment that pop-up's going to be too buoyant yeah, it's, for, it's over for buoyant yeah, for, yeah. for the rig mechanics but i won't add any putty to it no. because me personally i don't like to to have the bait anchored to the bottom i like to make it as sort of neutrally buoyant as possible to sort of compensate for the rig components you know yep. that that's that's a relatively big hook um, but when you shave the bait down to take the weight of the hook away, it, it isn't a very big hook, if you know what I mean. So I'm not adding any more weight to that, and all I'm doing is literally just shaving that pop-up down just so it sinks very, very slowly. And fishing on places like Linear, where you are probably going to get a fair few bites, and if you're not getting bites, you're going to be chopping and changing. If you're shaving the pop-up down, obviously it's going to lose buoyancy a lot quicker than what it would be if you hadn't broke the skin of the pop-up. So these aren't staying out at sort of 12, 14, 16 hours. They're only staying out for a maximum of eight, you know, eight hours, 10 yeah. hours overnight, should I not get anything through the night. So you know the rig is always working effectively, but that, mate, that is literally my sort of go-to rig, certainly when I'm fishing over bait, um, just, just because I know, you know, from doing the underwater thing before, which we did, the hooking potential of the rig is just unbelievable. They don't, they don't get rid of it, do they? They suck no. it in and they're nailed. Would you rather, would you rather stay? I want you be and slowly walk away. So, as per Tom's orders, we've just put out sort of half a dozen spots each over our areas for this evening. Um, because Tom's had bites the last two evenings from six o'clock onwards, um, he was very keen for us to get the rods out and sort it a little bit earlier than normal. So the zigs have come in. Well, Tom's brought all of his zigs in. Uh, I've brought two of my zigs in, I've put one out on a zig, two out on the 360s. Tom's put all three of his back out on the 360s on his baited area. Um, and the bait 
very simple. I've known Tom for years, I've worked with him for years, and the one thing that always sort of amazes, not me so much because I'm used to it with Tom, but other anglers when we're at shows and, and on social media is how simple his bait mix is. People think that you need 25 different ingredients to catch carp, and Tom proves that a few simple ingredients is all you need. So we've got sweet corn, we've got hole and chop boilies, and some liquid, and that's it. Uh, plenty of attraction both, both in the water in terms of smell and taste and also visual attraction with the bright sweet corn and then those yellow pop-ups that are being fished over the top obviously mimic the sweet corn. Um, Tom's had over 150 30s off this linear complex over the years so uh, and I don't think the mix and the principles of the mix have changed in all that time so really looking forward to uh, hopefully getting one of these linear fish myself this evening. So basically, the uh, inner Simo Hunter in me has come out and uh, after not catching anything for two nights, going past this evening's bite period, I've uh, yeah, put some zigs out, which I think is the best possible way to get a few bites. You know, fishing on the bottom for the previous two nights, nothing's happened. The fish are a lot more active tonight, but they're not wellying out, they're just sort of like rolling over. There's been a massive fly action. This is the final night, so it's like, Nothing's happened on the deck. The chance of catching on the bottom is probably slim. There's still quite a few angles on there and no one else has caught anything. And the last two bites have come on zigs. So final night, I'm putting zigs out. So I've gone to sort of like four and a half to five footers, which is a couple of foot below the surface. And they're out there now. And you know, the spot is quite sort of visual at night. There's a big tree that I'm sort of aiming at. So if it gets to say midnight, one o'clock and I, decide to wake up and, and have a recast I can get them back on the bottom and it, it's not too hard but for now like the thought of catching a 15 pounder is sort of like is overtaking my ambition of catching Kempis so uh, I've chucked three zigs out and we're going to see what happens probably not going to catch Kempis but there's always next week <laughs> Feels like I'm in January. <laughs> Literally, my bum is <laughs> shaking. No, it's like my undiagnosed diabetes kicking in. I just need a Lucas aid. <laughs> I just need a fix. I'm just like curling up in a ball in a minute. You right there, Tom? Yeah. I thought I'd just come to your rescue with the uh, keeping me the dry. <laughs> well, if you can't, you if you can't play one in the bivvy, you take the bivvy with you. Every good caddy always carries an umbrella for the pro. Wow. It's actually quite nice playing it under the umbrella. This, uh, this is day ticket cup and it is finest. <laughs> Take, <laughs> taking the brolly that you put outside the front of your bivvy actually over, over you while you're playing a fish. <laughs> Tactical change has worked, hasn't it? Well, it has. It's, um, there was that many fish out there earlier. It was like doing me in. I know it's only just selling on like a four and a half I think. Four and a half footer. It just shows that if they're not on the bottom it, you literally cannot, I know it sounds so you know so obvious but you cannot catch them on the bottom they just will not have it. I'm trying to see if that's under my other two. Or... Oh Lewis you nearly missed it again then you'd have been a, hey you'd have had to go go back to taking your MVQ in netting fish. <laughs> Is he in, Lou? I'm very happy. I've had a Chinese and now I've had a Simo. Very happy. <laughs> Life don't get much better. Perfect night in Oxford. Eh? This is just like, you're you, you topping this here, really. Here he is, another man of mirror, probably a scraper 20, this one. And you know, so many people say to me, Oh, I can't see, you know, a zig working at night and, you know, they only work on nights where the moon's out and it's nice and bright. Well, let me tell you, there is not a single bit of light shining through. It's real dense cloud drizzling. And this was on a black piece of foam of about four and a half, five foot off the deck in probably seven foot of water into sort of 
where I'd seen a lot of fish crashing earlier. And it's only early in the night, half nine, um, so we've not long eaten ourselves. So it's you know it's really good and sort of sets us up. Hopefully the night can be a can be a prolific one. I'll probably jinx it now, but if nothing else, this is a really good start to the night anyway. So I'm gonna slip him slip him back, and like I said, I clip the rod up on the way in. So I'm gonna whiz the other two in, clip them up to exactly the same range, exactly the same depth, fire them back out, and hopefully we'll have another fish to show you. Well, if ever there was proof that uh, your change of tactics before dark was a uh, stroke of genius, the second zig bite in, in the dark. Yeah, probably about 20, 25 minutes after the other one, so. Absolute, yeah. yeah. Another, another chunk, probably 24, 25 pound this good, one. Good 20. So, so it was like, you know, typical of the sort of stamp that you're probably gonna catch, like the sort of 20 pound bracket fish. They seem to love them, but. Hopefully, it'll be a prolific night. And this this particular fish actually came on the rod directly, directly above the baited the area that you'd fished for the last two nights without a bite. Yeah. And there you a bit of foam, four and a half foot above above, above a better bait, and it and it's rattled off. So, just goes to show they're always going over it. You know, there's enough fish in these lakes that like with your bait, there's fish always passing your bait. So just because they're not having it all the time, it don't mean they're not going past it. But you know, a zig middle of the night directly above the bait. What's to say if I didn't stick with the bottom, it probably might not have gone as well, but you know, this is certainly the first bite I've had directly over the bait at night and it was on a zig, so. Well. Bruce in the pudding, let's get them all on zigs. Uh, I can't ignore it. Um, I was already in the process of reeling, reeling the rods in whilst you were playing that fish because I said, if you, uh, if you prove the zigs are the one, I'm not gonna be backwards and coming forward. So get out all way. three of my rods are, are ready to go out on the zigs now that they're just lined up against the bivy ready to be cast out. Inspiring stuff, want to get one myself, um, but it's just brilliant now to see the machine in action. As they say. <laughs> oh, I don't exactly know what time it is. Um, sometime, well, it's just sort of getting light. So I guess it's between five and six or something, six and seven. <laughs> I was fast asleep uh, and I was rudely awoken by a, a steady take on the left hand rod. So yeah, sorry if I'm not 100% awake, but <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, I was in a very deep sleep, dreaming. Well, I'm not ashamed to admit, Tom, but that it's the first bite I've ever had on a zig rig whilst it's dark. Is it? Yeah. If I'd just woken up from a coma with a rod in my hand and you told me, Lewis, it's January and you're playing a carp, I wouldn't disbelieve you it's that cold. <laughs> just walk back down there. Yeah? Yay! <sighs> Happy days. First ever carp caught on a zig whilst it's dark. Tom's tactical genius paid off. Awesome. Absolutely awesome. As I said, it's just starting to get light on the horizon. Um, so I think I'm going to just drop this fish in a retainer for a few moments in the edge, let it get its breath back get the rod back out as quickly as possible because I think there's a, there's a good chance as it gets lighter that, that the zigs are going to become even more effective and then we'll, uh, we'll get it out and uh, show you it. Well, it's kicking off. I'd literally got my fish in the retainer, got the rod back out. Harry had to go to the car to change the batteries on the camera. Uh, Tom's rod's rattled off. He's landed 
Well, it's in the net now. 20 pounder? Yeah, 22, 23 pounder. So that's in the net. He's literally took the rod back out. Again, masterclass in efficiency. Quickly takes, unhooks the rig in the in the net, leaves the rig in, attaches another rig. Mate, you just did for us. Knock it off, I know you've even got the net. Uh, another, another rig on, bashed it back out to the spot and literally clipped the bobbin on and it's away again. So, yeah. It's a bit of carnage. It's, it's how, when I think of Tom Maker and Linear, the synergy of just nets and fish everywhere, it's going off, it's awesome. Yay. That is a perler, mate. That's definitely the nicest looking fish you've had. Finally, we're able to hold these two fish up for you. Tom's managed to land that common. Mine went uh, just over the 20 pound mark. Tom's 23 pound. Both caught on the zigs. Um, both at five foot. Five foot, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, brilliant. I'm really happy to get off the mark. It's been great watching Tom. Like I said, we've got about six hours left and I think there's still a chance that uh, there might be another one or two on the bank. So Definitely. we're going to get these ones back. Make and I'm going to get the kettle on because my it's hands freezing. are absolutely freezing. How about that? A stunning 26 pound man of farm common. Again, taken on a zig this is the ninth fish i've had now of my session the sixth one i've had since we've been filming and you know we've had to chop and change caught a few off the bottom then switching over to the zig is certainly you know come up trumps for us and it was nice to see you know lou last night after i'd had the, the first one on the zig getting his rod in chucking out on zigs and he hasn't actually you know he, unbeknown to me he's never actually caught a carp on a zig at night so so i have a bit of faith in what i'd said about you know they do actually work and it's not just a myth and he brought them in, changed over, and as you see, the session all round has been absolutely fantastic and probably got five, six hours fishing left. The weather's not going to improve much on what it was yesterday, quite dull and dreary, but hopefully, all the while the fish stay out there and the zigs stay out there, this might not be the last carp. So Tom, I think as uh, nine nine bites nine, on the zigs, yeah, nine bites, nine nine bites on the zigs. Uh, I think it's only right that we look at the zig in a little bit more detail. So, obviously, there's not a lot that can be done with a zig. It's a pretty no. pretty uh, standard tactic in in the way it's done, and the way that I fish my zig isn't that dissimilar to you. But I noticed there's probably three differences in the way that you've fished the zig to what I have done in the past. Yeah. So. First of all, the hook. Yeah. Uh, I noticed you got a beat point on there, beat so it's point. not it's not a zig and float with a hook up, which I would use, which has as the straight point. So, which hook's that, and why are you using that? That is a size six wide gate beat. That is, and yeah. over this, I've got so much confidence in a beat point hook. The fish that I'm trying to catch in the upper layers are exactly the same fish that I'm also trying to catch on the bottom. So, my sort of hook to lamb ratio is is I would say high, um, and. Basically, I, I've got so much faith in a beach point hook, I know it's going to work as equally as effective as, as, as what a straight point hook would. But for me, when I hook into a fish, it's, it's all about the confidence thing. So, you know, what, why change something that's not, that's not broken? So that, that's basically yep. my attitude with that. And it, 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 it works perfectly. So that's, yeah. Okay, so like moving along, the hook link is standard. Zig and float a hook link, which yep. I would use. Uh, the next thing I noticed, which I didn't actually notice to start with, until I actually stood and watched you lining up a cast, was that your anti-tangle sleeve kicks off at a, a bit of an angle, an angle and looks almost like a helicopter or a Paternoster rig. Yeah. At first I thought it was probably just because you'd pushed the, the sleeve on and it had just sort of kinked off at an angle, but when you did all three rods in one go, I noticed that all three were doing yeah, it. So I'm guessing there's off. some kind of method in that <coughs> madness. Yeah. Basically, like, you know, if you watch the Match Boys, they fish a Paternoster, 
when they're fishing a you know like a what would be an open end feed or a cage feed or whatever with a long hook link and say a single bit of worm or maggot so they're fishing with a long hook link and they, they twizzle the line to sort of create the, the boom which if you speak to them it keeps it away from your main line so all that is that's just um you know just an anti-tangle sleeve and what i've done is before i've put it on the zig it's just made a tiny little slit sort of four or five mil slit at the thick end at the thick end yeah obviously yeah on the, on the thick end of it that you push up over the clip pushed it right up onto the clip and then what it does it sort of creates like a bit of a bit of a shroud if you like underneath the the leg clip itself but where you slit the one side of it the side that slit sort of juts out a bit so you can see as that's hanging down yeah it's sort of like it's, it's kicking it so out it's rather not, than sitting like normally it sit like that so when yeah. you're casting it it can go anywhere but with that anything that can aid you with obviously the anti-tangle purposes is, is what you're trying to achieve and already yeah. that's sat away from the lead so for me that's saying that that's already away from the lead so when i'm casting it the stiffness of that anti-tangle sleeve is going to keep the hook bait away and you know we're chucking these sort of say 100 110 yards into a headwind which a headwind is the worst wind for a zig so anyway pushing the, the so hook it's link always back up pushing the hook link back yeah. up the line as, as it is but just by doing that i found sort of you know over the, the years of doing it that doing it that way it, again it just puts confidence in my head because i know that by doing that especially when you're chucking them out at night like last night well, you can't see them go out that. yeah you, you know, can't see it at night so you, you your second guessing yeah with zigs yeah. The, the biggest thing with zigs is your eye is your eyes because you've got to be able to watch when the zig goes out the separation between the lead and the zig because if you're not watching that and you're, it's out there and it's and you think it might be tangled then you're going to constantly keep chopping and changing and whereas i know with that provided i you know i give it a decent chuck just before it hits the water i say feather it down or i'll fish to a clip whatever yep. that that's that there is almost 99 percent tangle proof well i think Two of the three, two of your three rods produced bites in the dark last night. So yeah. I think you know on a recast yeah. as well. So like, you know, proof, I know that it, proof it, that they went out in the dark and didn't tangle. You know, and were perfectly fine. And when you've reeled in rods this morning, yeah. again they've come in with no signs of tangle. So I think yeah, yeah, massive confidence boost. And then the the final thing that's noticeable is the lack of a tail rubber. Yeah. Uh, again, that's just a three mil, just a um, bit of silicon. Three mil silicon sleeve, and I've literally just cut off say two or three mil. And basically what that does is on zigs, unless I'm fishing them in line, where say it's completely weed free and I know that there's nothing, nothing gonna get in the way. Whereas fishing out here, there's a little bit of low lying weed out there. And you've got a couple of humps round to your right, which if the lead hooks over them, you probably would be losing fish on them. Well, um, you know, we, and it, and you had it you know, yesterday, it, didn't it, it, it has happened. something where it snagged and up. And that basically just enables me to like know that the lead is gonna come off every time because it's, you know, it's so sort of flexible that as soon as that lead you know, a fish is picking the zig up from, say, that angle. As soon as that comes into, into contact with that piece of silicon, it just stretches and the, and the lead pops off straight away. So we're only fishing short zigs here, but even if you're fishing, say, a longer zig, you, you want the lead off to aid you in landing the fish because you've got to remember you're, you're playing a fish with a lead that's swinging around and all that's going to end up doing is going to work the hook loose and it's just, you're just going to get no end yeah. of hook pull. So anything that can aid you in landing a fish, fishing with zigs, is, you know, is well worth doing. They're a method that... You know, a lot of people find it hard to get their head around and, you know, just a few little subtle changes like that can make them as effective as fishing on the bottom because you know they're not going to tangle. As I predicted, Tom did have one more fish left in him before we had to uh, head for home. And what a fish. Saved the best of last, didn't we? What a fish to end an uh, epic session, to be fair. Considering the conditions and the lake that we're on, uh, one of the toughest 
day tickets on the linear complex. So to, to get as many bites as we have and to finish it with a zip linear at linear. At, at linear. Great fish, great company, lots of great information shared. Have and, you learned uh, a lot? I've learned not to share a swim with you and get <laughs> duffed up, but uh, yeah, no, it's been brilliant. And uh, once again, proof that chopping and changing from off the bottom onto zigs, changing the color of the zigs, changing the depth of the zigs, constantly working when you think you should have had a bite and you haven't had a bite, you haven't stopped. Make and it happen. Making it happen. Awesome. That's it. Hope you've enjoyed this session, the first of many with the Fox Consultants. We hope to see you on the bank soon. <laughs>